Welcome back. I'm Craig Dumont, and I'm thankful that you're here with us for this session. The Christian doctrine of creation specifically sets forth a beginning of time and matter with God creating all things out of nothing simply by calling them into being. As Peter Lightheart notes, creation comes into existence not from a big bang, but with the spoken word. Further, all things were created not only good, but very good. In fact, the psalmist declares time, time and time again all the way through the psalms that the creation that he sees and participates in, that he lives in every day, even after the fall, is amazingly, awesomely, jaw-dropping good. The doctrine of creation finds its foundation, of course, with the, the first two chapters of Genesis. Now, it doesn't end there as creation declarations and themes building on these first two chapters are, are woven throughout the entire Bible. I mean, literally from cover to cover, all of Scripture is filled with these creation themes. However, the multitude of all the other God-breathed references are understood and interpreted through Genesis 1 and 2. Now, this session is dedicated to underscoring the vital importance Genesis 1 and 2 held for the early Christians. Now, the only way to get a sense of this is to look at the very works of the church fathers themselves. What did they think? How did they understand the creation account? What did they teach concerning creation in six days uh, as presented in Genesis? Without fear of overstating the fact, there simply was nothing like the Genesis account uh, of creation that existed in the ancient world. Granted, there were, there were many, many mythological creation accounts floating around the ancient world like there are today, and, and evolutionary ones as well, just like today. Many included references to events that had truly taken place. For instance, uh, a worldwide flood, which shows up in every ancient civilization. But these accounts were so distorted from man's attempt to escape God that they had, from the earliest post-flood days, warped into myths disconnected from truth. They were completely irreconcilable with the Genesis account. Attempts to synthesize God's revelation with ancient Near East legends uh, or view it as just a simple variation on the multitude of creation myths is it's biblical, theological, and historical malpractice, to be honest with you. The reality is that these two chapters are completely unique. A God who creates the cosmos out of nothing simply by speaking. A world that was created very good and without conflict, at peace and in obedient compliance and harmony with the Creator. A God who is all-powerful, sovereign in his actions, and loving and generous towards his creation, bestowing abundance and beauty in every act. Man created in the image and likeness of God, his creator, to, to rule over creation. Man and woman created for a harmonious relationship with each other and with God. The true story of creation revealed as God himself gave this through divine revelation. These were shocking claims, and they've changed the world. Rather than trying to fit the Genesis account into one of the existing paradigms of the day, the early church fathers sought to demolish any and all other creation myths. Genesis, with its divine revelation of, in the beginning God created, created out of nothing, was vitally important. Genesis 1 and 2 were mined by the early church fathers to produce rich and comprehensive commentaries, to uh, create numerous sermons to their congregations, and for public debates with pagan philosophers and rival religious leaders. Again, the claim that man was created after the culmination of the creation of all else, and that that all else was good, was remarkable. Further, mankind was made in the image of God himself. No other creature was. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over all the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And after the creation of mankind, he then delegated kingly responsibility to him, not only to live in a world majestically made, but to name every aspect of that world and make it even better. 
So incredibly unique and powerful are the claims of the creation account in Genesis, claims that climax on the sixth day with the creation of Adam, the Athanasius, an early church father, who in composing one of the most important works on the incarnation of the word, of course called the incarnation of the word, takes us back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, right from the introduction. We will begin then with the creation of the world and with God its maker. For the first fact that you must grasp is this, the renewal of creation has been wrought by the selfsame word who made it in the beginning. There is thus no inconsistency between creation and salvation, for the one Father has employed the same agent for both works, affecting the salvation of the world through the same word who made it in the beginning. Athanasius followed up with the Genesis account of God's thought and design in creating man. From it we know that because there is mind behind the universe, it did not originate itself. Because God is infinite, not finite. It was not made from pre-existent matter, but out of nothing and out of non-existence, absolute and utter God brought it into being through the word. He says as much in Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Paul also indicates the same thing when he says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which we see now did not come into being out of the things which had previously appeared. For God is good, or rather, of all goodness he is the fountainhead, and it is impossible for one who is good to be mean or grudging about anything. Grudging existence to none therefore, he made all things out of nothing through his own word, our Lord Jesus Christ, and of all these his earthly creatures, he reserved a special mercy for the race of men. Upon them therefore, upon men who, as animals, were essentially impermanent, he bestowed a grace which other creatures lacked, namely the impress of his own image, a share in the reasonable being of the very word himself, so that reflecting him and themselves, becoming reasonable and expressing the mind of God, even as he does, though in limited degree they might continue forever in the blessed and only true life of the saints in paradise. The Genesis account captured the thought and imagination of virtually all the church fathers of the first 400 years, especially them, and even later theologians through the 1400s. For them, there was no doubt that the account is true. The majority understood the sequence of events to have taken place over six days, and that the creation account was provided to us through the divine revelation knowledge granted to Moses. For example, Basil the Great, among the most influential early church fathers, preached sermons on the six days of creation through Lent in the mid-300s. These sermons were turned into a commentary that would become the most authoritative and referred to source on the topic for hundreds of years. Basil essentially begins his teaching by insisting this account can be fully trusted as it came from Moses, who wrote it through direct action of the Holy Spirit. And what, what Basil says concerning Moses, it's something that is noted and repeated time after time in all of the works of the church fathers. I, I think it's important. In fact, it's crucial for us to consider his thinking in this extended quote from his opening sermon on the six days of creation. Now, this is somewhat lengthy, but you need to hear it to understand for yourself the interpretive grid all the church fathers worked from. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. One. It is right that anyone beginning to narrate the formation of the world should begin with the good order which reigns in the visible things. I am about to speak of the creation of heaven and earth, which was not spontaneous as some have imagined, but drew its origin from God. What ear is worthy to hear such a tale? How earnestly the soul should prepare itself to receive such high lessons! How pure it should be from carnal affections, how unclouded by worldly disquietudes, how active and ardent in its researches, how eager to find in its surroundings an idea of God which may be worthy of him. But before weighing the justice of these remarks, before examining all the sense contained in these few words, let us see who addresses them to us. Because if the weakness of our intelligence does not allow us to penetrate the depth of the thoughts of the writer, yet we shall be involuntarily drawn to give faith to his words by the force of his authority. Now it is Moses who has composed this history. Moses, who, when still at the breast, is described as exceedingly fair. 
Moses, whom the daughter of Pharaoh adopted, who received from her a royal education and who had for his teachers the wise men of Egypt. Moses, who disdained the pomp of royalty and, to share the humble conditions of his compatriots, preferred to be persecuted with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting delights of sin. Moses, who received from nature such a love of justice that even before the leadership of the people of God was committed to him, he was impelled by a natural horror of evil to pursue malefactors even to the point of punishing them by death. Moses, who banished by those whose benefactor he had been, hastened to escape from the tumults of Egypt and took refuge in Ethiopia, living there far from former pursuits and passing forty years in the contemplation of nature. Moses, finally, who at the age of eighty saw God as far as it is possible for a man to see him, or rather as it had not previously been granted to man to see him, according to the testimony of God himself. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak, mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. It is this man whom God judged worthy to behold him face to face, like the angels who imparts to us what he has learned from God. Let us listen, then, to these words of truth, written without the help of the enticing words of man's wisdom by the dictation of the Holy Spirit, words destined to produce not the applause of those who hear them, but the salvation of those who are instructed by them. 2. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. I stop struck with admiration at this thought. What shall I first say? Where shall I begin my story? Shall I show forth the vanity of the Gentiles? Shall I exalt the truth of our faith? The philosophers of Greece have made it much ado to explain nature, and not one of their systems has remained firm and unshaken, each being overturned by its successor. It is vain to refute them. They are sufficient in themselves to destroy one another. Those who were too ignorant to rise to a knowledge of a god could not allow that an intelligent cause presided at the birth of the universe, a primary error that involved them in sad consequences." Some had recourse to material principles and attributed the origin of the universe to the elements of the world. Others imagined that atoms and indivisible bodies, molecules, and ducts form, by their union, the nature of the visible world. Atoms reuniting or separating produce births and deaths, and the most durable bodies only owe their consistency to the strength of their mutual adhesion. A true spider's web, woven by those writers who give to heaven, to earth, and to sea so weak an origin, and so little consistency, it is because they knew not how to say, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Deceived by their inherent atheism, it appeared to them that nothing governed or ruled the universe, and that all was given up to chance. To guard us against this error, the writer on the creation, from the very first words, enlightens our understanding with the name of God. In the beginning, God created. What a glorious order. He first establishes a beginning so that it might not be supposed that the world never had a beginning. Then he adds, created, to show that which was made was a very small part of the power of the Creator. In the same way that the potter, after having made with equal pains a great number of vessels, has not exhausted either his art or his talent. Thus the maker of the universe, whose creative power, far from being bounded by one world, could extend to the infinite, needed only the impulse of his will to bring the immensities of the visible world into being. If then the world has a beginning, and if it has been created, inquire who gave it this beginning, and who was the creator, or rather, in the fear that human reasoning may make you wander from the truth, Moses has anticipated inquiry by engraving in our hearts, as a seal and a safeguard, the awful name of God. In the beginning God created. It is He, beneficent nature, goodness without measure, a worthy object of love for all beings endowed with reason, the beauty the most to be desired, the origin of all that exists, the source of life, intellectual light, impenetrable wisdom. It is he who in the beginning created heaven and earth. To give some context to Basil's theology here and what makes his teaching on Genesis so powerful, let's take a look at who he was and his intellectual background. 
Basil received his initial education under the supervision of his father, and then he studied uh, under the finest teachers in Caesarea of Cappadocia, and it was here that he made the acquaintance of St. Gregory the Theologian. Later, Basil transferred to a school at Constantinople where he listened to the eminent orators and philosophers. To, to complete his education, Basil went on to Athens, a center of classical enlightenment where he had the future emperor Julian for a fellow student. After a four or five year stay at Athens, Basil had mastered all the available disciplines. He studied everything thoroughly, more than others are wont to study a single subject. He studied each science in its very totality as though he would study nothing else. Philosopher, philologist, orator, jurist, naturalist, possessing profound knowledge in astronomy, mathematics, and medicine, he was a ship fully laden with learning to the extent permitted by human nature. In terms of the influence of Basil's preaching on the six days of creation, Gregory the theologian, an incredibly close friend of Basil's uh, from his days studying in Athens, wrote, when I take his, talking about Basil's, hexaemeron in my hand and read it aloud, I am with my Creator. I understand the reasons for creation and I admire my Creator more than I formerly did when I used sight alone as my teacher. Again, turning to the biographies of these men, let's look at who Gregory was. Gregory spent six years in Athens studying rhetoric, poetry, geometry, and astronomy. His teachers were among the most renowned pagan teachers of his day. Uh, Basil, the future Archbishop of Caesarea, also studied in Athens with St. Gregory. They were such close friends that they, they seemed to be one soul in two bodies. Julian, the future emperor and an apostate from the Christian faith, again, he was studying philosophy in Athens at the same time. Upon completing his education, St. Gregory remained for a certain while at Athens as a teacher of rhetoric. He was also familiar with pagan philosophy and literature. Basil and Gregory, like most of the other church fathers, possessed towering intellects instructed by the elite teachers of their day. Now this is so important for us to understand, is by taking up the Genesis creation account, Basil wasn't some unlearned, illiterate, gullible believer buying into some mythological fairy tale. Rather, with the highest level of human learning, he understood through faith Genesis to be revelation knowledge overthrowing and destroying the prevailing philosophical and religious worldviews of his day. Basil, like, like the Apostle Paul before him, was one of the most learned intellectuals alive who had his eyes opened and mind transformed through Christ and brought alive in the Spirit. Keep that in mind when Basil writes this about creation on the third day. Let the earth bring forth green grass. Let the earth bring forth by itself without having any need of help from without. Some consider the sun as a source of all productiveness on the earth. It is, they say, the action of the sun's heat which attracts the vital force from the center of the earth to the surface. The reason why the adornment of the earth was before the sun is the following, that those who worship the sun as a source of life may renounce their error. If they be well persuaded that the earth was adorned before the genesis of the sun, they will retract their unbounded admiration for it, because they see grass and plants vegetate before it rose. Basil clearly accepts and believes that grass, plants, and trees are created before the sun and moon. He thinks that this is a big deal, and he's not alone. Ambrose, in sermons that he preached in 389 AD, drawing heavily on Basil's work, he says... Let everyone be informed that the sun is not the author of vegetation. How can the sun give the faculty of life to growing plants when these have already been brought forth by the life-giving creative power of God before the sun entered into such a life as this? The sun is younger than the green shoot, younger than the green plant. Look at the plants of the earth, which preceded in time the light of the sun. The bramble preceded the sun. The blade of grass is older than the moon. John Chrysostom, another close friend of Basil, was also taught by Libanius, the first classical scholar and rhetorician of his age. Per Wikipedia, Libanius was a teacher of rhetoric of the Sophist school in the Eastern Roman Empire. His prolific writings make him one of the best documented teachers of higher education in the ancient world and a critical source of history of the Greek East during the 4th century AD. Libanius was adamantly opposed to the Christian faith, but even so, considered Christostom his finest student. Shortly before his death, in fact, around 393 AD, he was asked who he wished 
to be his successor. And he replied, John, if only the Christians had not stolen him from us. <laughs> Christosom began a very profitable practice of law, which opened to him a brilliant political career. However, he felt both were incredibly corrupt, or at least, the, at the very least, strongly inclined towards corruption, and he, and he left them behind. After several years of training in the Christian faith and he gained, trying to gain life experience as well, and almost wholly against his own desires, he entered full-time ministry. To cut to the chase, John Christosom was not some unknown person lacking learning and refinement. He knew the power of the spoken word and carefully and skillfully used them to communicate clearly and without ambiguity. He too preached and wrote on Genesis and understood it to be literally and morally true. On vegetation before the sun, Christostom writes, Hence, Scripture shows you everything completed before the creation of this body, the sun, lest you attribute the production of the crops to it instead of to the creator of all things. Affirming his understanding of how he perceived the six days of creation, he says of the creation of the sun on day four, He created the sun on the fourth day, lest you think it is the cause of the day. Of course, Christostrom, like all the church fathers, talks about Moses. He also believes the sequence of the creation of the whole world is of great importance. For that reason, the blessed Moses, inspired by the divine spirit, teaches us with great precision, lest we fall victim to the same things as they, instead of being able to know clearly both the sequence of created things and how each thing was created. You see, if God in his care for our salvation had not directed the tongue of the biblical author in this way, it would have been sufficient to say that God made heaven and earth, the sea and living things, and not add the order of the days, nor what was created first and what later. There is no doubt that the earliest Christians and the church fathers read the Genesis creation account as stated as events in real time and in actual progression and sequence. God spoke, and in the briefest moment, in fact, literally in no moment, but instantaneous with the word, Earth began by germination to obey the laws of the Creator, completed every stage of growth and brought germs to perfection. The meadows were covered with deep grass, the fertile plains quivered with the harvest, and the movement of the grain was like the waving of the sea. Every plant, every herb, the smallest shrub, the least vegetable, arose from the earth in all its luxuriance. At this command, every copse was thickly planted. All the trees, fir, cedar, cypress, pine, rose to their greatest heights. The shrubs were straightaway clothed with thick foliage. The plants called crown plants, roses, myrtles, laurels, did not exist. In one moment they came into being, each one with its distinctive peculiarities. One of the earliest church fathers, and perhaps the most influential, was Irenaeus, who was a student of Polycarp, whom himself was a student of, uh, taught directly by the Apostle John. Irenaeus, writing just 150 years or so after the ascension of Jesus, insisted that God created all things out of nothing, asserting that creation as an act of divine love from the triune God and thus the non-hierarchical goodness of all creation, the necessity of the Old Testament for rightly understanding God, and the redemption of all things, a culmination of God's purposes for creation. It wasn't only Moses he turned to, though. Irenaeus also grounds his teaching in the Gospels and the Apostles, especially Paul. In fact, so energetically did Irenaeus take up the biblical case for creation and its ramifications, some have understood him to have early on to have articulated a fully orbed doctrine of creation. Then there's Victorianus, an early Christian ecclesiastical writer who flourished around 270 AD and who was martyred during the persecution of the emperor Diocletian. He composed commentaries on various works of the Bible, including Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Eze Ecclesiastes, uh, Matthew, Revelation. Um, he also wrote a separate tract called On the Construction of the World. Victorinus, again referencing Moses, writes, To me as I meditate and consider in my mind concerning the creation of this world in which we are kept enclosed, even such is the rapidity of that creation as is contained in the book of Moses, which he wrote about its creation and which is called Genesis. 
God produced that entire mass for the adornment of his majesty in six days, on the seventh to which he consecrated it with a blessing. I do want to point out that there are two exceptions that have to be addressed. The first is Gregory of Nyssa, Basil's younger brother. Gregory wrote a follow-up to Basil's commentary shortly after Basil died. Robert Louis Wilkin, in The Spirit of Early Christian Thought, writes this on the difference of interpretation. Although Basil's homilies exemplify how Christian thinking about the origin of the world was shaped by the account of creation in Genesis, some, intellectuals no doubt, were apparently dissatisfied with his effort. Gregory wishes to explore certain of the philosophical and cosmological questions in greater depth. Between the lines, one detects signs of sibling rivalry. Gregory is pleased to address the topic without having Basil looking over his shoulder, and he seizes the opportunity to move out from behind the commanding figure of his older brother. Gregory was a more penetrating thinker than Basil and gave greater attention to philosophical difficulties posed by the biblical narrative. He thought his brother had not adequately dealt with the central problem presented by the account in Genesis that creation is depicted as taking place over a series of days. What needs to be explained, says Gregory, is how one can make sense of the narrative of the coming into being of the natural world that is sequential. For we know by observation and experience that all the individual parts of the world are interconnected. Just as one cannot have life without warmth and water, and birds cannot fly without air, so there cannot be day and night without the light of the sun. It is impossible for one part of nature to be created before the other parts. To put it somewhat whimsically, if everything is not in place, certain wild animals would go hungry while waiting for their prey to be created. The idea of a sequential creation is unintelligible to reasoned inquiry, whether the inquirer be a Christian bishop or a Greek philosopher. Essentially, to solve this problem, Gregory interprets, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, as in the beginning God made the heaven and the earth summarily. Gregory said they convey the sense that everything was created together or instantaneously. The second exception is Augustine. Now, Augustine had the same problem as Gregory in terms of God speaking and creating things in sequence or in, in a progressive way. But his reason was totally different. Peter Lightheart says this, For Augustine, the claim that God speaks immediately raises a question of temporality and change. If God spoke in time, then the utterance necessarily involves change. How can an unchanging God utter the opening words of the creation account, Let there be light? Cutting to the essential answer he came to in order to solve his dilemma, Augustine concludes, God made each of them simultaneously, still made by none but God, and was simultaneously created with the things that were formed from it. Now, I would ask you to keep in mind that I've only given a few minutes overview of a complex thinking process Augustine went through. However, it's essentially an accurate summary of a philosophical problem of his own making, and then he came to that conclusion. But there are a couple of things to keep in mind here without drifting too far into the weeds. First, while Basil's brother Gregory was also a tremendous thinker, and, and he was a phenomenal theologian, by the way, as was their sister for that matter, considering Basil's education, his writings, his experience, it's a little much to say that Gregory was a more penetrating thinker than Basil. Now, interestingly, Basil may offer his own counter-argument to that, uh, uh, you know, just uh, without even have thought of it, but he says he wants God's creation to penetrate your thinking. I want creation to penetrate you with so much admiration that everywhere, wherever you may be, the least plant may bring to you the clear remembrance of the Creator. A single plant, a blade of grass, is sufficient to occupy all of your intelligence in the contemplation of the skill which produced it. It's the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that is the penetrating thinker who allows us to have the mind of Christ, as opposed to our minds being distracted by human philosophical systems opposed to God. And as we'll see in later sessions, the reality is that a blade of grass is sufficient to occupy all of your intelligence. Studying a blade of grass or a leaf or an orchid will leave you speechless if, if you just open up your eyes. 
So that statement seems to me to portray Wilkins' bias towards an evolutionary account, as he immediately follows up his assertion by stating that this shows that the church father, speaking of, of Gregory, uh, the fathers knew that the account in Genesis could not be taken literally. It really says no such thing, as Gregory went out of his way to revise the very first verse so he could take it literally. Second, an instantaneous creation is not an evolutionary one. For both Gregory and Augustine, the problem was creation as sequence when they thought everything was so interdependent that one part couldn't exist without the other. In other words, the cosmos in their thinking was irreducibly complex. Now, that term was brought to public attention in 1996 when molecular biologist Michael Behe published his book titled uh, Darwin's Black Box. In the book, Behe describes how biological systems at the molecular level are irreducibly complex, meaning that they are made up of so many complicated parts and subsystems, all of which have to be in place in order for the system as a whole to perform a useful function. If it's not there, it doesn't work. Intricate systems cannot be built up step by step or sequentially as Darwin's theory requires. Gregory and Augustine were great men, and they, they were a blessing to the church, and both believed in the special creation of man, a historic Adam, and a real historic fall, and of course the accuracy of the genealogical records of Genesis and the flood. Neither one of these men would have allowed any room for an evolutionary account in their understanding of Genesis 1 and 2. Augustine thought Genesis so important he wrote several commentaries on it, and ultimately, commenting on all the supernatural acts of God, he realized that I believe in order to understand. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Centuries later, St. Anselm of Canterbury echoed this statement in similar fashion. I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. These great Christian thinkers understood the proper use of reason must, must be preceded by faith in the proper object. Not faith in ourselves or faith in science, but faith in God, specifically in his revelation of himself in his son, Jesus Christ. But with great respect for Augustine, by the mid-300s, there was so much written and preached on the six days of creation by the most highly regarded Christian theologians affirming the Genesis account that Ephraim the Syrian declared, So let no one think that there is anything allegorical in the works of the six days. No one can rightly say that the things pertaining to these days were symbolic, nor can one say that they were meaningless names or that other things were symbolized for us by their names. Rather, let us know in just what manner heaven and earth were created in the beginning. He also understood the days of creation to be 24 hours long. In his commentary on Genesis, he writes, After Moses spoke of heaven and earth, of the darkness, the abyss, and the wind that came to be at the beginning of the first night, he then turned to speak about the light that came to be at the dawn of the first day. At the end of the twelve hours of that night, the light was created. The light remained a length of twelve hours so that each day might also obtain its own hours, just as the darkness had obtained a measured length of time. Although the light and the clouds were created in the twinkling of an eye, the day and the night of the first day were each completed in twelve hours. Following up on this, Ephraim describes how the plants appeared. Although the grasses were only a moment old at their creation, they appeared as if they were months old. Likewise, the trees, although only a day old when they sprouted forth, were nevertheless like trees years old when they were fully grown and fruits were already budding on their branches. The grass that would be required as food for the animals that were to be created two days later were thus made ready. And the new corn that would be food for Adam and his descendants, who would be thrown out of paradise four days later, was thus prepared. Discussing Ephraim's great works, which included a number of Bible commentaries and well over 400 hymns, the author who wrote the introduction to his works made note that the book of Genesis was a book to which Ephraim returned on more than one occasion. He drank from that source, not only from here and in his hymns on paradise, but throughout his hymns, Ephraim found that the book of creation is a treasure house of the ark, the crown of the law. 
Finally, on the subject of creation of light on day one and the sun, moon, and stars on day four, Peter Lightheart provides a perfect summary of why the early Christian fathers emphasized the creation order so strongly. Since at least Augustine, readers of Genesis 1 have puzzled over the apparent contradiction between day 1 and day 4. How can there be a cycle of light and darkness, day and night, when there is no sun or moon? Many have taken this apparent anomaly as evidence that the days of creation are not temporal periods at all. This misses the thrill of one of the most dramatic moments of the creation week. On day four, the Creator delegates a crucial act of creation, separating, to creatures. Sun and moon and stars are created to carry on Elohim's work. No wonder ancient peoples were tempted to worship heavenly lights. Ever since, creatures continue to carry on the creative work of separating. I've only had time to cover several of the early church fathers and their understanding and teaching of the six days of creation. However, their understanding is representative, actually the norm of how the Genesis account of creation and the understanding uh, of the Bible as God's authoritative revelation permeated all Christian thinking through 1,500 years. After conducting a thorough study of early church fathers, Eliezer Gonzalez, who holds a PhD in early Christian history and, and an MA in theology and in early Christian and Jewish studies, published an article titled, The Role of Genesis Creation in the Writings of the Apostolic Fathers. Gonzalez writes, a study of these earliest extant post-canonical Christian writings shows that not only did the apostolic fathers assume, but they also explicitly uphold the Genesis account of a literal six-day creation. In doing so, these authors do more than merely echo New Testament emphasis. They indeed develop them further, making the doctrine of creation a fundamental part of the foundation of their theologies. Speaking of their commitment to a fully biblical approach and their study to understand all aspects of what God was saying, he reminds us that even as they believed in the literal six-day creation period, they were more than capable, they were more than able to extract deeper spiritual content that God was conveying to his church. The church fathers were convinced that scripture operates on a number of levels and that it contains implicit spiritual meanings. It is impossible to overstate the importance placed upon the truthfulness and reliability of Genesis account by virtually all that we consider the church fathers and the early defenders of the faith. I wanted to share some of their history because these were brilliant men raised up by God to teach, lead, and edify the early church. The early church fathers were men who were incredibly sophisticated in their thinking, men who were able to handle intellectual, philosophical, and theological concepts at the very highest level. They understood that while Genesis gave an accurate, actual account of creation in six days, that there was so much more to pull out. They knew, as the psalmist declared, that God's commandment is exceeding broad. They also poured over scriptures, praying after David, Open up mine eyes that I might see wondrous things from the Word. God's Word with understanding provided by the Holy Spirit, transformed all their thoughts, giving them the mind of Christ. They thought through the meaning and the implication of creation, of incarnation, of Jesus being both very God of very God and very man of very man, and what that means in every aspect of Christian thinking and theology. Now, they were able to conceptualize and articulate a biblical theological statement on the Trinity, which means that there is one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Stated differently, God is one in essence and three in person. I mention this because the doctrines that we now take for granted were the result of immense study of scriptures, sharp and intense debate, or iron sharpening iron arguments that they were all out in the open and for what we would now call peer review. These men, like the Apostle Paul, were able to think and speak at the highest spiritual, conceptual, and theological levels. They were not men who were ignorant of ancient worldviews or basic cosmology. I'm not implying that the church fathers were infallible or that we have to agree with them on everything that they said. But these were men of renowned learning and had great love for God and his people. In fact, they absolutely destroyed all the vain philosophies and myths that had kept the world in darkness until the incarnation of the light of the world. In essence, through a fully developed doctrine of creation, they created in and through the power of the Holy Spirit the world as we understand it today. 
as we are seemingly falling back into the myths and fairy tales presented as some great learning, it's once again vitally important to rearticulate a comprehensive Christian doctrine of creation given to us by divine revelation. As I touched on in the introduction to this series, the early Christian thinkers gave a great deal of thought concerning light for that very reason. They are referred to as theologians of light. Uncreated light, created light, light for the soul, light for the mind, light as it relates to visibility, light as it relates to revelation, light as it relates to life, light as it relates to salvation. Let's end with John's creation account in John 1, 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you, and God bless. I will see you in the next session.